a lot of the metaphysical distinctions we've been making in talking about gender are actually going to be applicable in some sense to race. Because we're going to have to ask ourselves a question about what is race? Is race an essence? Or is it something else? Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' famous book, The Soul of Black Books, right? There's an idea, especially early on in Du, in, uh, du Bois, theory of race usually ascribed to something like an essentialist theory of race, that black folks are essentially one thing, white folks are essentially something else, and that mixing them fundamentally makes some kind of mistake. Miscegenation is when races mix together and produce offspring that are uh, biracial or mixed race. If race is a pseudoscientific concept, then why the hell would you be talking about it? Why is it that it is one of the major factors in the history of this country? If race is fundamentally something we don't think is real, how does it have so much social capital? And not just in this country, many other countries. Go to Brazil, go to France, where it's not strictly speaking race, it's something like colorism. So for instance, if you go to India, talking about light skin and dark skin Indian people, uh, I think this is also true in the African American community. Alchemy studies need to be a thing in the universe. No one's going to make that argument because we now accept that the alchemy is a pseudoscientific idea about physical, uh, physical change and reality, and we just say it's pseudoscience and it's just wrong. Why is it that we let the concept of race do that if we accept that the concept of race is a pseudo? It cuts two ways. One side of it is we should just be post-racial and quit talking about this pseudoscientific concept because it anchors us into an incorrect vision of reality that's not serving anybody. This is sometimes they call the colorblind. It's problematic because it just reproduces a lot of racist stuff. And the other extreme, race is real, and they should just be separate from each other. They get along, but they should have their own ethno states. Because if you try to mix them, moral failure, or it's a cultural failure. And there are people who advocate for that on all sides, right? There are black nationalists who want to separate from white people, and right there are white nationalists that want to separate from other people, right? You can imagine all the problems that go along with that. We've seen the horrifying violence of the 20th century around ethnic, uh, ethno-chauvinism and how, that, how disastrous that, that is. Well, liberalism claims it can do something very incredible. Liberalism claims that it can take people from all different backgrounds, all different races, all different ethnic groups, and it can give them equality. And you can live in a, an idea called multiculturalism. The question is, is it working? It's a mess. So that's our framing question for this question about race. What is it, and why does it persist? Why does a pseudoscientific concept persist? The concept of race is a modern concept. There is no concept of race prior to about 1705. Let's rewind back to the days of the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Parthian. There is no evidence that we can find legally in their record. You don't see a concept of race in those documents. You see insider-outsider distinctions. So there are Jews and non-Jews. By the way, the Bible can't even make its mind up about that. You can convert. Now, I can't easily convert to becoming a black person, but you can convert to becoming a Jew. That's weird, right? Because again, the concept of race is not there yet. For them, it's all just sort of an amorphous sense of culture. So there's no clear concept of race in the Bible, for instance. The Romans don't make any real distinctions that we would recognize as race. Now, they distinguish different people in the world, and they definitely distinguish barbarians from themselves. In ancient Rome, you see your barbarian status by become a citizen. The Romans don't make any distinction, so far as we can tell, between outsider and insider if you're a citizen. Because you have to understand how big the Roman Empire was. Race does not exist in the ancient. It doesn't really exist in the medieval world. You just don't get that distinction. It's not until later. Now, to be clear, lots of tribes have ethnic chauvinism. So let's distinguish here between ethnic chauvinism and racism. Your ethnic group is just better than everybody else. In fact, if you look at the names of many Native American tribes, the name of their tribe is indistinguishable from the word for human being. Dine, the name for the Navajo, Hopi, these are just words that mean human being which tells you what they think about other tribes. They're not. Native Americans, like every other human being in this world, are people, when there are scarce resources, they fight. And we know they fought. There were giant empires, the Aztecs, and the Triple Alliance, and all those. Yeah, so this whole idea that everything was peaceful and hunky-dory before the Europeans showed up. There was ethnic chauvinism. But there were always ways of permeating the chauvinism. So, for instance, if I were Navajo, and I captured a Hopi woman in war, when I captured her, she just became Navajo. But notice in modern racism, there's no way to move between the races. Because any mixture at all, called a blood quantum, makes you into that ethnic group, and there's nothing you can do to get out of it. The racial theory says once you are a race, there's no getting out of it. But in the, these pre-systems, yes, they separate between one group and another, but these groups, there's, the boundaries here are porous. What scholars think are sort of the two things that really represent the origin of, of, of race. First is anti-Semitism. It's the hatred of Jews. It's not the hatred of Judaism. It's the hatred of the entire group of Jews. The origins of anti-Semitism have to do with the origins of Christianity. 
right? It is a splinter group within Judaism that sort of gets a life of its own. And what Christianity claims is that it is a supersessionist, that Christianity replaces Judaism. That Judaism is simply redundant or irrelevant or outdated once the arrival of Christianity occurs. So the first aspect of how this is going to work is going to be supersessionism. It means that you can just actually put everybody that belongs to this group into the wrong. The second part. Now, because Judaism and Christianity are sort of coming apart by the second century, what happens is that there is a great deal of animosity between Christians and Jews, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because you probably have a bunch of Jews saying that what Christians believe is wrong, and they don't like that. That makes a lot of sense. This separation is happening at the same time that Christians are beginning to write down their holy text for the first time. You look at all the Gospels, they can't agree on what miracles Jesus does, they can't agree on, even on where he comes from, right? Sometimes he comes from Nazareth, sometimes he comes from Bethlehem. They can't agree on who his uh, mom and dad are sometimes, right? Sometimes it seems like Joseph is his dad, sometimes it seems like God is his dad, right? The, the text, the, the mythology being formed around Jesus is very convoluted. Now, the very early texts, like Mark, make it very clear who's responsible for the crucifixion. The Romans did this. Pontius Pilate had Jesus executed. Crucifixion is a Roman mechanism for execution. It's not a Jewish mechanism of execution, and Jews couldn't execute people anyway because they were occupied by the Roman government. So they couldn't, they couldn't do the death penalty anyway. As the Gospel stories develop, especially by the Gospel of Matthew, what you see is that as Christianity begins to want acceptance in the Roman Empire, there's a basic problem here. It can't demonize the Roman government. By the Gospel of Matthew, rather than making the Roman Empire the instigator of the crucifixion of Jesus, it begins to push the blame onto the Jews. He still uses this phrase, right? You wash your hands of something? He washes his hands, and he says, I am washing the his blood off my hands. And if you want to have him crucified, you can have him crucified. And the crowd says, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 26, the crowd says, let his blood be on us and on our children. That moment, you see a switch from the word the Jewish people to Hoi Yehudoi, the Jews. In 1348, the plague arrives in, uh, in Europe, and no one knows why this is happening. The plague is devastating. And what seems to happen is that in Muslim areas and in Jewish areas, the plague seems to not be as severe than it does in Christian areas. They wash their hands. You might bathe twice a year in Christianity. Europeans just didn't bathe that much. And if you don't bathe that much, if you come in contact with dead bodies and you and then you eat right after that, you're going to carry the plague. Also, because the Jews are living in isolated areas away from Christians, the plague just didn't reach. Now, Christians saw that the Jews were dying at lower rates than the Christians, and the logic leaped immediately. If you read the text about the cremation of Strasbourg, you know what the leap was. The Jews were poisoning the wells. And this theory that Jews were poisoning the wells, right, was a pan-European phenomenon. You see it all over Europe. It spreads rapidly through Europe. The confluence of Jews are poisoning the wells, and they killed Christ, and the idea there is we can kill them all. All right, so on Saturday, that was St. Valentine's Day, they burned the Jews on a wooden platform in their cemetery. There were about 2,000 of them. Those who wanted to be baptized were spared. Many small children were taken out of fire and baptized against the will of their fathers and mothers. And everything that was owed to the Jews was canceled, and the Jews surrendered all the pledges of the notes they had taken for debts. The council, however, took the cash the Jews possessed and divided among the working men proportionately. Uh, the money was indeed the thing that killed the Jews. So thus were the Jews burned at Strasbourg, and in the same year in the city of the Rhine, where the free cities are imperial cities. And sometimes they burnt the Jews after a trial, and others without a trial. In some cities, Jews themselves set fire to their houses and cremated themselves. So again, what you're seeing here, right, is the idea of corporate guilt. That as a population, right, you can target an entire group of people and you can blame that people for your social ills. Now notice what's happening here, right? They're using the plague as a cover. The Jews can live Christian money and interest, which was a huge part of how Jews were allowed to make money in the Middle Ages. The next issue, what we call anti-Jewish canards. Poisoning the wells is one of them. This is called the blood libel. It is a persistent myth. In order for Jews to satisfy certain religious functions, for instance, the making of masa at Passover, that they are required to mix their bread with the blood of a Christian, usually a child. Now, if you know anything about Jewish law, you know that this is not possible because Jewish law has very strict rules about the consumption of blood. No blood is allowed to be consumed at all. And so even with uh, meat, the animal has to be drained of all blood and salted before the meat can ever be consumed to be kosher meat. In fact, meat with, uh, blood with, meat with blood in it is not kosher. 
uh, some anti-Semitic ideas, right? That uh, Jews control the bank, Jews control the media, uh, the Jew controlling the whole world. I bet all of you have heard some version of one of these canards. Jews control the banks, Jews control Hollywood, Jews control the news. So the idea here, right, is the idea that everything that is wrong with somewhere is fundamentally the Jews' fault. These images and these ideas go back to the Middle Ages, and they are still very powerful. If you give a man a gun, he can rob a bank. If you give a man a bank, he can rob the world. The ethnicity crosses color lines, because Jews existed before color mattered. Now, the idea here, overwhelmingly, is that all these different kinds of Jews control the world, and they are ultimately responsible for all the bad stuff that goes on in the world, whether it's immigrants, or the banks, or you lost your job, or Israel, or whatever, right? Pick your thing, and the Jews are to be blamed for it. So this is the first trap to setting up racism. People is somehow secretly responsible for the lack of success of the other groups. All right? That's the idea. That's Hitler's idea. Germany is destroyed because Jews control everything, and they have destroyed the country from the inside out. They own the banks, and they have destroyed the country. And Hitler's idea was we must get them out of Germany in order for us to be able to have Germany for the Germans. All right? And the Jews are undermining it. And we looked at this book by, uh, by Martin Luther, a famous Protestant reformer. He wrote a book called On the Jews and Their Lives, I think written in 1543. Uh, it says that if you want to close a synagogue, you should close the Jews up inside the synagogue and burn it down. It is just a horrifying piece of, uh, of literature. Luther, by the way, early on, once we get correct Christianity, they'll all convert to Jews are like, yeah, we don't want to be Protestant either. And he's like, the damn Jews. If you read it, right, he's more or less calling for genocide. Again, this is so violent, you could just, Hitler just reprinted it without any changes. Uh, in fact, that which is not the mess is not history. People are complicated and people are bad and good. Martin Luther was good at some stuff, bad at others. His, his combating the indulgences and church corruption, great. Urging genocide, not great. Anti-Semitism is still around. Treblinka was one of the death camps in the Holocaust. You can draw a very clear line from the cremation of the Jews in Strasbourg and, and plague period directly to that. Europe as a thread running through it. Part of that thread is anti-Semitism, that deep hatred and skepticism of Jews. It's horrifying. Treblinka is a nightmarish place, right? Uh, men, women, and children just all destroyed there, right? And destroyed there because of the idea that they were destroying Germany, right? And then the lesson I think to learn about those places when I go there is I'm not different than people that were on the other side of that, right? To see yourself as a victim gives you, gives you a free pass. But to see yourself as the perpetrator that's when you have to think to yourself, okay, what do I need to do to myself? What do I need to do to my culture to make sure that doesn't ever happen? 